Um, I'm Nicola Triscott, I'm the director of the Arts Catalyst, uh, and I want to thank you all for coming to this event with uh, Mark Simmons and Ariel Guzik. Uh, and I also want to say hello to the audience that we have online, because we always have probably more people watching us online than actually come to the space. But thank you for coming to the space. It's always uh, difficult to get an audience in a heat wave, so it's really nice to see so many people have come uh, to hear about Ariel's work and to hear about uh, whales and dolphins. So, uh, a couple of practical details, no smoking in any part of the building, please, and there's a toilet on the half landing. Um, why this event has come together, uh, I met um, Ariel Guzik in Mexico City a few years ago. Uh, and actually, I'd seen, uh, I'd seen an installation of his before I met him uh, of the work that he'd been doing with whales and dolphins, communicating uh, with whales and dolphins. And, uh, and then I met him and found out more about his work. And uh, obviously was really hopeful that we might be able to work with him one day. Uh, and this is uh, hopefully the start of that process. So Ariel came over uh, at the beginning of the week and we've been up on the, on the Moray Firth in Scotland meeting the bottom of those dolphins that live up there. And um, <clears throat> I didn't know much about, I think many people kind of think that whales and dolphins live in warmer climes, but Mark, uh, Mark Simmons, who I met, will be talking to us first, um, I met uh, some months ago. And, uh, and He's just given me this, and these are all the whales and dolphins that you can find just in the UK, which I think is absolutely extraordinary. So I'm on a learning curve, and I think many of us will be on a learning curve about this. Ariel mostly works um, studying whales and dolphins off the coast of California, uh, where there are thousands and thousands of them. Um, and uh, in the Moray Firth, around the northeast coast of Scotland, there are 200 dolphins. And the, the scientists who study them are the local people who, uh, who observe them and watch them and uh, campaign for their health and well-being, know them by name. They're all named, and they know them by sight, which I thought was really amazing. And they are a very robust group of dolphins, it would seem. Uh, I thought they would be very difficult to find. We were very fortunate with the weather, of course, but I think we were also very fortunate, uh, and maybe that just, there's a, there's a good omen about this work with Ariel, that the dolphins themselves seem to want to collaborate with us. So every time we walked down to the point and went out on a boat, the dolphins seemed to gather around us to see what we were doing. So how the evening is going to work tonight, uh, Mark Simmons is going to speak first and tell us a bit specifically about sound in the cetacean world and the impact of noise pollution in our oceans and the impact that that's having on marine life um, and on whales and dolphins and whom sound is such an important means of communication. Uh, and one of the things that was extraordinary out of the Moray Firth was putting a hydrophone down in the water and just listening to uh, the dolphins communicating the squeaks and the echolocation clicks they make. It kind of opens up a completely different world, which I wasn't um, aware of at all. So Mark's going to do that, and then Ariel is going to make a presentation uh, about his work. Uh, and after that, we'll kind of come together and open up the conversation a bit, so there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions and, uh, and to talk about the art and the science and the issues facing whales and dolphins today. So first, I'm going to introduce Mark. Mark, uh, Mark Simmons is an environmental scientist and a marine biologist. He specialises in the problems that are facing marine mammals in the current day. He's currently the Senior Marine Associate Scientist with Humane Society International, and he was previously International Director of Science with the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. Mark's been involved in investigations into the impacts of human activities on marine wildlife, including studies of the effects of chemical and noise pollution and marine debris on marine mammals, and the development of marine conservation policy, particularly as it applies to cetaceans, which includes 19 years as part of the Scientific Committee of the International Whaling Commission, 
Mark is also involved in field research on cetaceans in UK waters. He's produced over 200 original papers and other contributions for scientific and popular periodicals and books. And he re recently jointly edited and part authored Whales and Dolphins, Cognition, Culture, Conservation and Human Perceptions, which was published in April 2011 by EarthScan. And Mark has recently been awarded an OBE for his contribution to uh, marine conservation and cetaceans. So I'm going to hand you over to Mark. First. Thank you. So, uh, good evening. I hope you're all warm enough here. Um, it's, uh, bless you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be invited to come along and support uh, Ariel this evening. And uh, I won't keep you too long. But it's a, such a good opportunity for me to explain some some things, some things which are quite complicated. Can you hear me okay? People in the back, can you hear me? Yeah. To explain some things that are complicated, and I'll, I'll give this talk backwards, because I'll start off with some complicated things, and then I'll try and unravel them, and you can let me know how successful or otherwise I've been. So uh, just a couple of um, anecdotes to get us going. A few years back, I was struggling uh, to complete the text of a highly illustrated coffee-type table book about whales and dolphins, and my publishers have been pretty kind to me. They pretty much allowed me to write what I thought was appropriate. But um, they were less kind when they realized that I'd written twice as much as they needed. And so a lot of my fantastic prose hit the floor and was thrown away. And I was a bit devastated. I was left with what I thought was a skeleton. And the reality, of course, was that the book was probably hugely improved um, by that process. And I, I lived with that. I moved on. And then they had another problem with me, which is that they didn't like one of the titles for one of my <coughs> opening chapters. In fact, for chapter one, they took grave exception. And um, what I wanted to call this chapter was, Who are the Whales and Dolphins? But the publisher preferred, entirely reasonably, what are the whales and dolphins? Now, what, of course, applies to a thing, and who generally implies a person. And that was the distinction that I wanted to make. And uh, with all my piles of fine words burnt on the floor, I did, in fact, actually prevail on this point. So that's the opening chapter of a book that you've probably never seen and you never will. <laughs> my second anecdote I'll come back to that slide. My second anecdote concerns BBC Breakfast TV uh, just last week, something that I quite like to get up to. And um, I was watching it, and they were dealing with a story about whales and an experiment concerning military sonar, so loud noises used by navies to try and find each other. And the presenters seemed a little bit bemused about why this story was newsworthy. And, and the experiment showed that whales moved away from the loud noise source, this loud noise source which was emulating military sonars. And one of them said, well, you would, wouldn't you? I think it was Charlie State said that, I'm not sure. And um, the other presenter looked at him, and she probably raised an quizzical, beautifully arched and sculpted eyebrow, as if, what do you mean? And he said, well, you would. You would move away from a loud noise. To him it was obvious. And you would expect a whale, dare I say, like any other person, simply move away from a disturbing noise. You didn't need to spend millions of pounds of, of, of investigations to actually show that. I think that this was a bit of a silly season story of filler. Andy Murray at that point hadn't quite won Wimbledon yet, and obviously there was no other news going on out in the world, nothing was happening of any significance, and therefore we had a, a whale story. But in fact the story was about blue whales, an endangered species and the largest animal ever to have been seen on planet Earth. I'll show you the eye of one, there we are. And a very loud noise that is, very, that is being deliberately introduced uh, into our seas. And what I would like you to, to think about, perhaps, is whether or not it matters that uh, a whale changes its course when exposed to such a noise. So this very latest piece of research that I want to start with comes from a team of United States and Scottish researchers. And the reference, if you want to go and look it up, is here. You'll find it in the Journal of the Proceedings of the Royal Society. I hope some of you will look it up. Anybody writing it down? No. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what they said. I'm going to actually read their whole uh, abstract, because it's quite important. I think it sets the scene. This is the latest cutting-edge 
as of last week. So um, mid-frequency military sonars have been associated with lethal mass strandings of deep diving toothed whales. But the effects on endangered baleen whale species are virtually unknown. Here we used controlled exposure experiments with simulated military sonar and other mid-frequency sounds to measure behavioral responses of tagged blue whales, Balnoptera musculus, in feeding areas within the Southern California Bight. Despite using source levels orders of magnitude below some operational military sonars, our results demonstrate that mid-frequency sound can significantly affect blue whale behavior, especially during deep feeding modes. When a response occurred, behavioral changes varied widely from cessation of deep feeding to increased swimming speed and directed travel away from the sound source. The variability of these behavioral responses was largely influenced by a complex interaction of behavioral states, the type of mid-frequency sonar and received sound levels, so the actual sound level reaching the waves. Sonar-induced disruption of feeding and displacement from high-quality prey patches could have significant and previously undocumented impacts on baleen whale foraging ecology, individual fitness, and population health. So the reason that this research was important, and it should have been a story, was that uh, it was important in two ways. Firstly, there's very little information about how the baleen whales, that's the generally bigger filter feeding whales, uh, respond to these kinds of sounds. And secondly, these noises can potentially drive them away from their food. Now for us, when presented with a loud noise source, say for example the kids are screaming at home, you can ask them to shut up. If that fails, you can move to a different house, room, set up a new household with somebody else who doesn't have children, or take any number of different you know, uh, responses that will allow you to adapt to that. Actually, I was thinking as I was writing that last night that perhaps moving to a new house of somebody who doesn't have children doesn't necessarily avoid children, but you can get the general idea. The difference is that you will not be denied access to food. And that's the problem for the blue whales. So, now for the latest research to provide some of the background uh, to this. So, cetaceans are beings whose sensory capacities focus on sound and hearing. Don't be confused by the eyes. Yes, they can see, but this is a secondary sense for them. In the same way that hearing is secondary to us, or perhaps, perhaps I should talk about smell to make a comparison between our use of smell and their use of sight. It's very much a secondary sense to sound and hearing for them. Uh, and I've got to be very careful because there are 89 or so different species, and there are differences, of course, across those species in their sensory capacities. But why is hearing so important? It's to do with the medium that they live in. So we do a little bit of physics now. Water is not as compressible as air. It is stiffer. You know this. You can experiment on this when you get home. Try pushing some water together, pushing some air together, see how it works out. And what this means is that sound travels much better in water than it does in air. And if any of you dive, and I hope some of you do, you will know that as you go down below the water surface, light cuts out very quickly, especially in the very muddy waters around the United Kingdom. So cetaceans evolved in a world that it's only natural that their primary sense would be suitable for that medium. And many of them evolved to feed at great depths. So here sight would be useless, and hearing is exclusively their only primary sense, apart from perhaps a little bit of taste. They may be able to taste the water as well. But certainly hearing and sound are the primary uh, way that they find their way around. They, of course, have got to return to the surface to breathe. They are mammals. They have blowholes instead of nostrils. And back at the surface, again, their eyes will actually be useful uh, to them. When you look at a whale or a dolphin, much of the head structure and some species have uh, huge heads, is concerned with sound production and hearing. The remarkable big square head of the sperm whale, or cachalot, is mainly a huge acoustic lens. The rounded forehead of the harbor porpoise, or the bottlenose dolphin, is a similar, um, similar lens. We don't know what all the structures are about. For example, if you ask me what the remarkable tusk of the narwhal, these are old classic Victorian pictures I'm showing you by the way, I don't know what that's for. 
There's lots of theories about it, but we don't know everything about these animals. They are still wrapped in mystery, and I think that's one of the things that makes them very interesting. Now, we and most terrestrial mammals produce sound by vibrating our nasal cords with air. Toothed cetaceans, toothed uh, whales and dolphins, and porpoises do this by vibrating totally different structures in their heads, uh, and obviously they do it without the need of a continuous air supply. supply. And the baleen whales do it, well, again, actually, we don't quite know how they do it. That's another one of, of the mysteries. But what we do know is that baleen whales make noise with enthusiasm, and if they are not the loudest animals in the animal kingdom, they are pretty close to it. So these illustrations that I'm showing you uh, for this first part of the talk are from Victorian natural history books. Uh, they were very popular in the uh, United Kingdom. And it gives you a good idea of what the people at that time thought these animals actually looked like. They had no other sources of information. The Victorians were not Googling or watching TV or seeing Jacques Cousteau's films. And basically, the whales would have either presented themselves uh, to them as um, be presented to them as either blimps or some kind of weird monster. And it might not be insignificant, of course, because the Victorian period was a time when whaling was already uh, being um, quite um, productive. So I've already said there's a great variety in this order of mammals, the cetacean order of mammals. The tooth species not only listen to their environment, but they also produce sounds in order to explore it. And these are mainly high frequency clicks used in echolocation, or if you like, animal sonar. In the same way that you can see things because light is bouncing off them, they can see things because they are deliberately bouncing clicks off them and then listening for returning. Uh, echoes. Perhaps the equivalent for us would be shining a torch around the dark room, sending the light out, and it's coming back. We're able to uh, interpret. And echolocation um, is known to allow these tooth cetaceans to identify objects that are only a few centimeters um, in size at distances of some 10 meters or 30 feet. And many of you, I'm sure, will have seen some of these weird diagrams of the heads of. Uh, whales or dolphins. So here's one that gives you some idea that the, the sounds are being produced up here below the blowhole and some of the structures here and then they're focused out through the melon and uh, the melon uh, can change its composition and can change its shape to some extent in some species and this is then bouncing off objects like their prey or the world around them and curiously because of the physics involved in this the sound is thought to be picked up through the lower jaw and returned to the middle and inner ear through the lower jaw. So this is another one of the peculiarities about this uh, order of mammals. Very, very different uh, to our uh, situation. Some cetaceans not only click, but they also produce whistles and tweets. Now, when I used to say whistles and tweets, that was okay in the past, because nobody <laughs> was tweeting in a different way. Please, they're not doing that as far as we know. These sounds are clearly used for communications between themselves. So what we're now focused on, basically, is the dolphins. This is actually quite a large group of species, uh, which all commonly live in groups. All of them, as far as I know, coordinate their activities, and that's where communication is obviously uh, a key consideration. In addition to using sound for finding food and navigation, sound can also be used for a whole range of other things. Um, here's one of those interesting Victorian pictures. And here, what you can actually see is a group of, uh, of dolphins attacking a rowing boat. And this, of course, is fictional. That's what the Victorians thought was going on. And if you look very carefully, you can see that some of these guys are armed with pointy sticks to try and persuade these marauding dolphins to go elsewhere. What they were probably doing, of course, was coming up to try and bow ride, something which dolphins would normally be welcomed to do uh, in the uh, modern world. But just look at how they're depicted uh, at this time. So. Um, just accepting that that's, um, that that's wrong and coming back to our issue of communication. So with communication, you can do mate identification and selection. It can help you with that. You can, of course, help the mothers and the calves keep together, especially in turbulent, muddy waters. They can signal each other. So that will help them, which is obviously very important. These are mammals. The calf will stay with its mother for a number of years. It will suffer from its mother for the first few months and so forth. And it's also, of course, generally helpful in terms of group cohesion and coordination, alerting others to and avoiding danger, 
recognizing individuals potentially, which could be important, and of course the transfer of information between individuals may also be facilitated by the sounds that they're making. Now the baleen whales, and here's a much better Victorian image of, um, oops, much better Victorian image of um, a humpback whale made by Captain Scanlon, who was trying very hard at that time to try and work out what the whales looked like so that they could share them up more evenly between the whaling captains. The baleen whales produce lower frequency sounds, moans and groans, and that wonderful undulating melody of the humpback whale. Each humpback whale song consists of a number of units that are repeated in a certain sequence for about 10 or 20 minutes. And then this sequence is repeated over and over on again and goes on for hours. Only the males sing, and this is mainly on the winter breeding grounds. They all sing the same song. That song evolves through the breeding season. They then go away, they migrate away to their distant feeding grounds, and then when they come back, they resume the song at the same point that they left off. Isn't that remarkable? You know this song, you hear it in New Age music, and sometimes in shops and things. I wish I could do it. If I was Jane Goodall, I'd at least you know, <laughs> imitate the animals I'm trying to be an advocate for, but I can't. Uh, each humpback, so each humpback does that, and um, the songs and the calls of the great whales are obviously communications, and their lower frequencies reach a lot further than the high frequency calls used by the dolphins. So historically, the whales may have been calling to each other pretty much across entire ocean basins. And for the big whales, whale calling outside, I don't know if you heard <laughs> for the big whales, that most of which are highly migratory, contact calls may have been very important in helping them to find one another, which is a pretty essential prerequisite, I'll try that word again, prerequisite for breeding, of course. Now you'll notice that I've started to speak in the past tense, and the reason for that is that whales will no longer be able to hear each other across the distances that they used to, because the noise that we have added to the oceans is blocking that. And here I'm thinking less of the spectacularly loud noises that come from certain military and industrial sources, and the industrial sources include the acoustic surveys used by the fossil fuel industry to find oil and gas deposits below the seabed. I'm thinking more of a constant drone of shipping. And Chris Clark, the Cornell uh, University-based acoustician, put it something like this. The growing noise pollution in our oceans is doubling every decade. And, and as a consequence of this, a blue whale that was born in 1940 would have had its acoustic bubble the distance over which its vocalizations can travel and others can be heard, it would shrink from some 1,000 miles to now only about 100 miles. And then coming back to that new research on blue whales, the frequency of the sounds used by the military and emulated in those experiments uh, were much higher than the calls of the whales. So this is where these figures come in that I'm showing you down here. So, these are the frequencies that were used in these trials in this latest experiment. And this is the frequency, the low pitch voice of the blue whale. And that's significant and that's new because until this work came out, we pretty much assumed that noises of concern would be in the same frequency range that the animals could hear based on the noises that they produced. Are you still with me? Yep. <laughs> Ariel will be with you in a minute. And that's quite significant, so we now need to rethink some of the mitigations that have been thought about. The low frequency calls of whales may also help their navigation. The high frequency clicks of dolphins and porpoises and other species are well established and essential to their navigation and their prey feeding. But the bigger baleen whales, those loud, those low calls, could also be bouncing back off large physical structures like rocks, icebergs, the edges of continents, islands, and so forth and could help them to navigate. They might have in their, in their brains, for example, an acoustic map of the world which helps them to move around the world. And if that sounds a little bit speculative, it's because it is, but I'd ask you to also think about how on earth would you explore that issue? How could you try and show one way or the other if that was true? So I'm going to just show you some more modern illustrations. And Nicola very kindly waved the Field uh, Studies Council uh, field guide uh, to uh, the UK's Marine Mammals Act earlier on. These are some illustrations from that field guide, so you can see what these animals uh, really look like. 
compared to what the Victorians thought they looked like. Um, and they're all by the wonderful uh, natural extremist writer Lucy Mollison. So let's go back to what we know. In 1975, Melbourne and David Caldwell reported that dolphins produced whistles that were unique to individual animals. These allowed dolphins to distinguish one another. They were calling out and giving something equivalent to names. They were saying their names to each other. Newborn dolphins can whistle, but those unique signature whistles, as they're called, develop when the animals are three months to a year old. And dolphins, especially bottlenose dolphins, Note the scale change here. There's a person, but there's a bottlenose dolphin. These are the animals that Ariel and his colleagues have been looking at in the, in the Murray Firth. Um, are the best studied of all the cetaceans. They famously have a, a large and complex brain, and much has been made of this, and all their various behaviours that indicate high intelligence. A significant part of their brain is certainly to do with the processing capacity that they must need to analyze the acoustic signals that they're receiving. Some of those they're receiving by just listening, and as I've already said, some of those are to do with the echolocation signals that they produce actively. They live in a world of sound and hearing, as we live in a world dominated by light and sight, and I can't emphasize that enough to you this evening. Now, we're no longer Victorians. We know about this previously secret acoustic world, and how we're fogging it. We know how our loudest noises can displace whales, and in the worst instances, how loud noises can cause strandings and death. These last events are fortunately rare, but not insignificant either from a welfare or a conservation perspective. With knowledge comes responsibility. Our sounds may have an adverse effect on these animals across their whole ranges. We need to be a lot quieter in the seas, and minimize the use of loud noise. In particular, we need to keep our loud noise out of their key habitat areas. And this is far from straightforward, especially when you consider the following three things. Firstly, that the main industry involved in loud noise production is the fossil fuel industry, arguably the most powerful industrial sector in the world, and the one which our societies are mainly highly dependent upon. That loud noise has become a key part of defense strategies because of increasingly stealthy submarines, which require increasingly powerful sonars to actually find them, and we all need to be defended. And um, so much of what I'm talking about happens out of sight and out of mind of most people, and conceptually, it's very difficult, I think, for us as terrestrial mammals, you do know that you're terrestrial mammals, um, to get our brains around how cetaceans uh, live and perceive things. Modern cetaceans have been around in their current forms since the Miocene period. Uh, the fossil record indicates that, and that's from something 23 to 5.3 million years ago. The genus Homo, our tool using and undoubtedly empathetic uh, ancestors, pop up a relatively recent 2.3 million years ago. So a case can be made that the first intelligent life forms on Earth were in fact in the sea. A case can also be made that as they still don't wage war, construct nuclear devices, feel, fill the atmosphere with climate changing gases, and then deny the effects of those gases, as we do, that they are in fact the more highly evolved species. So for more information about um, some of the things that I've touched on, I'm going to recommend a couple of books to you. There's a very, very elegant uh, 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 treatise in a book, very readable, in defense of dolphins, the new moral frontier by Thomas, Professor Thomas I. White, in which he makes the case that uh, dolphins should have their personhood uh, recognized, so if you want to know more about that. And I hope you'll forgive me if I'll mention that book that Nicola mentioned in the introduction again, in Wales, and, with this catchy title, Wales and Dolphins, Cognition, Culture, Conservation and Human Perceptions. <laughs> Another argument with the publisher, lost that one. Um, <laughs> Um, thinking, thinking whales and dolphins. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, in that book, we look at all the latest evidence, uh, including some of this background to the noise problems and other problems, and uh, consider where that leads us. It's an edited tome, a series of contributions coming in uh, from all around um, the world. And as I was um, finishing off this uh, talk last night, Thank you to 
to people, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it became apparent uh, to me, uh, or I suddenly got a message, that there was a fantastic video just being produced um, by the uh, NGO Ocean Care, which actually says everything which I've been trying to say to you now rather better and with, with nice images. And it only lasts about four minutes. So um, I have permission just to show this to you. Let's see if it works. See what you think. Cetaceans have lived in our oceans for millions of years. The smallest one, the Hector's dolphin, is about 20 times smaller than the blue whale, the largest living organism on Earth. Its heart is so big that a person could almost stand in it. Cetaceans find their way even in the darkest ocean depths. In it calls and detect obstacles and prey from the reflected echoes. Cetaceans often communicate with each other. They stay in touch by calling to each other and spread out and likely exchange information on the occurrence of prey or predators. Some species can only reproduce because they can communicate over hundreds of kilometers and thus find each other. But underwater noise is increasingly masking the acoustic world of cetaceans. Noise levels in the oceans have doubled every decade for the past 60 years in some areas due to various human activities. Without countermeasures, underwater noise will further increase. Over 90% of world trade is transported by ship. Ship propellers generate intense noise. Cetaceans are exposed to ever-present noise in major shipping routes. Once a ship has passed, another will follow shortly. Chronic noise causes stress, which in turn affects the health of cetaceans and may also reduce their breathing success. Whales are acutely threatened during military exercises when warships turn on their sonar. The extremely loud sonar sounds spread for tens to hundreds of miles in all directions and are used to detect submarines. Whales appear to change their diving behavior in panic to escape the noise. This seems to cause divers' bends or decompression sickness, affecting vital organs, which can lead to death. Some fatally injured or dead animals beach on the shore, but many die on notice on the open sea and sink. The noise caused by seismic exploration for oil and gas is also loud, pervasive, and continuous. During the ship surveys, the seismic air guns produce intense pulse noise every few seconds, often for weeks or months. Air gun pulses are so loud that they can travel through thousands of meters of water and penetrate tens to hundreds of kilometers into the Earth's crust. The echo reverberates from oil and gas deposits all the way back to the measuring devices at the surface. The noise can cause the marine environment to be heavily degraded over large areas, forcing some marine life to abandon their habitat. Thus the livelihood of cetaceans may be destroyed, and so their life. Underwater noise pollution is a serious threat to marine life. Together we can change the situation. We call for a global strategy to reduce underwater noise pollution and ask for marine protected areas where noisy activities are not allowed. Support our worldwide campaign against underwater noise pollution. Become a part of Silent Oceans. Get involved with Silent Oceans Dark That's, that's very well explained, don't you? Um, I know that there will be some quibbles from some acousticians and others with some minor aspects of that, but I think it gives a very good uh, impression of the way that animals use sound and the general problems that they face. And so, with that said, I will shut up and you can meet Harriet.